Good morning. Welcome to the virtual worship service at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Portland. We're really grateful for the technology that allows us to gather safely and to continue our witness to God's love and justice in this city. As we do every Sunday, we begin our worship with a few moments of silence. God of all creation, on this glorious, crisp August morning, be with us. Be with us in our speaking and in our listening, in our singing and in our silence. Amen. And now let us call ourselves to worship. Come with your questions. Come with your need. For the God who broods over chaos meets us in this place. Come with your energy. Come with your weariness. For the God who breathes life into the dust meets us in this place. Come with your grief. Come with your joy. For the God who dared to become human meets us in this place and invites us to heal and become free. The ancient testimony this morning reminds me of how <clears throat> sometimes our families don't deal with difficulties in healthy ways. Even in the Bible we see this as in Genesis 37, 1 through 4, and 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Beha and Zippah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. They could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock of Shechem? Come, I will send you to them, he answered. Here I am. And so he said to them, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let's go to Gothen. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Gothen. They saw him from a distance. And before he came near them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him in one of the pits. And then we will say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he said to them, 
he delivered them out, him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galeed, with the camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to the brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother and our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. And then some Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Jacob up, lifting him out of the pit. And they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Thus ends the reading. This is one of our foundational stories, and now we will sing our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation. I wish we had all been together so we could hear ourselves singing that. <laughs> we have some children with us this morning, yes? I think I see, is Thomas there? Thomas is there, yes. And let's see who else. Oh, Swan is there too. I need them. I need them. Look, who, and who else is here? Yeah. Oh, there's the little one. Dante? 
how are you doing this morning? <laughs> and George is here, of course. Anyone else that I'm not seeing? That's uh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. That's I have a question. Oh, I have a question, and this this question is probably more for like Thomas than anyone else. Uh, Thomas, you have a younger brother, right? Yeah, his name is Soren. Yes, Soren. And does he sometimes annoy you? Um. Mm, 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 sometimes I crash his train and he yells at me. Yeah. Okay. Well. Maybe sometimes he takes something that you want to play with, or maybe he makes loud noises while you're trying to concentrate, or he just generally is in your way, right? Is that right? I'm sure. Yeah. So what what happens when he does that? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do when when Soren annoys you? Or gets in your way, or makes loud noises. When I crash into his train and he yells, I say, "Come on!" I thought we were having fun crashing train. Oh well, that's really nice. That's a nice way of dealing with it. What are the other things you say sometimes when you're not feeling so nice? Stop eating until you answer the question. Yeah, I can eat until when I eat my raspberries. So what are some of the things you do when you're when you're when you're mad at Soren? Mm. Okay, Soren, can you stop yelling? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 yeah, well I know what I used to do. I had a little brother who was four years younger than me, and when he would bother me, I would grab him by the top of the head and hold him out there and I would punch him in the arms. <laughs> that wasn't very nice, was it? <laughs> and then his arms weren't long enough to reach me because my arms were longer. <laughs> yes, I wasn't a very nice girl at, at some of those times. Well, w I, it sounds to me, Thomas, like your parents have had some conversations with you about how maybe to handle those situations um, using your words and not reacting the way you feel like you should react. Is that true? Yeah. Do we talk about that sometimes? Do we talk about your reactions and help them get less violent? O F C O R U S E. Oh. Of, of course. course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, great. Well, we all need somebody in the room to help us not do some of the things that we might do that might make us feel bad later. We need people with us sometimes to stop us from hurting others and maybe even from hurting ourselves. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. We're going to hear a story about Joseph and his brothers, where Joseph is the little brother, and he has a whole bunch of big brothers. Uh, Anne read us part of that story from the, from the uh, scriptures already, and I'm going to talk about that a little more later, but thank you for for sharing with us this morning. Wish we could have some of those of those strawberries you're eating. Yeah. <laughs> Wish we could have some too. Thanks. Let's sing our song that we sing for the children's time. I am not hearing the song. The hallelujah song? Grant is muted.
Grant, you are muted. Okay, well, we're going to move right now into the modern testimony um, for this morning. Anne, would you? Yes, yes. Thank you. The modern, the modern testimony this morning is an excerpt from interviews with Resma Ma'akim, therapist, activist, justice, leadership coach, and author, who integrates a somantic and neuroscientific approach to healing trauma. Trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. Trauma in a people looks like culture. Thank you, Anne.
Thank you. Thank you, Grant, for arranging that wonderful hymn about the Bible that's in our hymnal into an anthem in just a week's time. Amazing. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer, our source and our ending. Amen. This morning's sermon title is Hurt People, Hurt People. Anne read for us the beginning of the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis. And in some ways, the book of Genesis is all about this. The book of Genesis is full of origin stories that are sacred to both Jews and Christians. In Genesis, we find two stories of creation of the cosmos and of our world. There's also the story of how humans lost access to the garden of blissful ignorance. In Genesis, we also find stories of how envy, jealousy, and violence first entered into human culture. All of this in just the first few chapters. Later, there's the story of Abraham and how the Is Israelites and Ishmaelites came into being those feuding brothers with the birth of the sons of Abraham. But Genesis doesn't tell the whole story. Genesis highlights the descendants of I Isaac while almost completely writing out the descendants of Ishmael. Genesis focuses on Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, Jacob, the one who later becomes Israel. And they, it focuses on that family's internal power struggle, complete with all the deceit and betrayal and then the reconciliation. All throughout the book of origins we know as Genesis, there are stories of conflict and violence. As we read these stories, we can't help but begin to notice that systems that privilege some and ignore or suppress others are woven into the very fabric of the culture of our ancestors in faith from the very beginning. Our reading today is the beginning of the story of Jacob's sons. But before this story begins, let me give you a little context. We have to understand that Jacob has become very prosperous. He has a very large family, many wives, many animals, many sons to help care for his flocks, but all isn't well within his family. Jacob's sons actually know the story of what their father did to his own brother. They know how their father pulled the wool over his father's eyes and tricked him into giving a large share of his wealth to Jacob, even though Jacob wasn't the oldest son and wasn't supposed to get the largest share. Yes, Jacob's sons are aware of this family story and they're always on edge, watching out for threats coming from their younger siblings. They clearly don't trust each other. At the time of this story, Jacob is old and he depends on his sons that he doesn't entirely trust either, but he depends on them to preserve the family wealth. And Jacob does have a favorite son, <laughs> which pretty naturally is his youngest son. It's the son of his favorite wife, Rachel. His favorite wife, not Rachel. But Joseph gets special gifts and privileges. He's also used by his father as a snitch. A snitch to inform on his brother. No wonder his brothers hate Joseph. They hate him even more 
because he claims to have these dreams that he arrogantly shares in front of the whole family. Dreams in which he, the youngest, is lording it over the rest of the family. Now, dreams in those days were considered to be communications from God, from the divine. So Joseph having these kinds of dreams was just maddening to his brothers. Jealousy and envy are on display as the brothers hear that Joseph is coming out after them where they're grazing the flocks. And so they plot against him to neutralize this bratty brother. But their plotting is no joke coming from this band of brothers. For a little context, if we look back in Genesis a few chapters to chapter 34, we find this group of brothers taking revenge on a neighboring tribe for the rape of their sister Dinah. They deceive and murder the entire clan to get even. Now, this is a traumatic episode in the Bible that we don't often hear about. It's pretty bloody. But it gives some weight to the threats that these brothers are hatching against Joseph. Although it was not recognized as a thing back in biblical times, we can imagine that the brothers' violent past would have left them with some degree of what we might now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And hurt people tend to hurt people. So when the brothers propose murdering Joseph, they have to be taken seriously. Resma Menicum, a practicing therapist who specializes in embodied trauma, would say that this band of brothers is living with decontextualized trauma. The trauma is in the past. They're not acting out of it currently. But he goes on to say that trauma decontextualized in a family begins to look like family traits. And so these siblings begin to look like gangsters. In our story today, though, not all the brothers share that gangster trait to an equal degree. There is one brother who seems to have held on to something like compassion. And that brother is Reuben. Reuben uses his deviousness to plot to save Joseph's life. He talks his brothers into throwing Joseph down the well rather than just outright killing him. He convinces them to leave Joseph there knowing that he will surely die of exposure and starvation. But secretly, Reuben plans to return and rescue Joseph. What Reuben doesn't count on is that greed will foil his rescue plans. The siblings notice a caravan of traders trekking to Egypt, and they offer to sell Joseph, and a deal is struck. The traders quickly pull Joseph out of the well and carry him off into slavery. But the brothers, now with money in their pockets, go forward with the plan that they hatched of putting some blood on Joseph's special coat, the coat that was given to him by his father, and telling their father that he was killed by a wild animal and he won't be returning. Our reading ends today in the middle of the whole story that's in the Bible about Joseph. I don't know about you, but one way that I learned to make sense of the Bible is to ask where in this story do we see things similar playing out in our own lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods and cities, and in our country? But it's easy to imagine that we see the long and painful history of brutality playing out from Genesis coming forward, playing out in the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, in the tear gassing and brutally dispersing of peaceful protesters, but even in 
the murders that occur among gangs in our cities. If this is a story about how we got to be the way we are, it's a very cynical and depressing assessment. It's one that reinforces um, one of the early Christian theologians, Augustine's view that humans are totally depraved. But I'm going to try to inject a bit of hope through the back door by looking at this story with a modern angle, looking at it through the lens of trauma psychology. Everyone knows, right, that hurt people hurt people. We see traumatized people inflicting yet more trauma on each other every day. Murder rates are increasing almost everywhere in the country. I keep listening back to my former hometown, Chicago, and hearing that there have been more children under 10 shot and killed in that city than there have been in 10 years in the last six months. That's not very hopeful. So now what? Well, another way I was taught to read a biblical story was to ask, with whom in the story do I identify? Where do I see myself? Well, I can see, see myself easily in Reuben. He stands out as exhibiting some compassion. Reuben also knows that in order to avoid becoming the target of his brother's wrath, he hides his intentions from them. It occurs to me when I reflect on this story and our present time that Reuben's intentions to save his brothers are like my own. To be a white ally in the struggle for justice for black lives. To right the wrongs inflicted on my brothers and sisters of color. I intend well, but what difference do I really make? As one person, I mean, I'm often foiled in my attempts by evil siblings, by bad cops, by racist, fascist authorities. I lack the courage and perseverance to continue fighting for justice when more powerful forces come against me or when Congress refuses to act to control guns. It's just more comfortable for me to fall in line with the powers that be than, than to try and continue fighting the abuse that goes on. Well, that's not very hopeful either. What else can we see here in this story? We have to maybe go beyond where we ended in the Bible reading today. As the story of Joseph continues beyond that part, we know that he gets to Egypt and he becomes a slave to Potiphar, but his ability to interpret dreams gets him noticed by Pharaoh. And ultimately, Pharaoh, Joseph interprets one of Pharaoh's really bad dreams, leading to Joseph making a recommendation for the good stewardship of Egypt's agricultural bounty. And as a result, Joseph gets elevated to a position of great power in Pharaoh's government. And then he ultimately gets an opportunity to help his family. They show up on his doorstep when famine sweeps through their country. Now, if you've ever seen the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, you know that Joseph becomes the hero in the end. But we may not know or we may have forgotten that Joseph helping his family get into Egypt and saving their life back then, his good deed on behalf of his family ushers the children of Israel into slavery in Egypt. And they languish there for 400 years before Moses rises up as a leader and leads them to freedom. More violence, more oppression. Is there anything here to pin hope on? 
I come back to what Resma Minikin says about trauma. Reading the text with Resma Minikin as a guide, him shining the light of embodied trauma on the family of Jacob, we can imagine or assume that Joseph and his brothers are all operating within a family pattern of, of trauma. Trauma that has not been addressed. Trauma that has become disconnected from the events that gave rise to it. Trauma that gets passed on because it isn't addressed. What Anne read to us today from Menicum's work says trauma decontextualized in a person starts to look like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family starts to look like family traits. Trauma in a whole people starts to look like culture. Jacob's sons, including Joseph, are stuck with the family trait of envy, jealousy, deceit, and desire for revenge. They're all there in all the brothers, including Joseph. So Joseph is ready to be triggered despite his miraculous rise to power in the Egyptian government. When Joseph sees his family coming to ask him for help in Egypt, he has at that moment the power of a fairy godmother to change his family's fortunes, but he has never healed his past trauma. And he doesn't see that. So when he first meets them, what rises up in him is embodied trauma. Joseph's body remembers very well that his brothers threw him in a well and sold him into slavery. And his body is ready to inflict pain on them. So while he up here wants to welcome them, his body doesn't trust them. So without knowing where it comes from, Joseph threatens them. He says, you bring your father here. And they say, okay, okay, we'll bring our father. You're going to help us, right? And Joseph says, but I want to keep one of your brothers here as hostage to make sure you're going to return with your father. I want Benjamin. He's the baby that's been born, Joseph is thinking. He's the baby who's now dad's favorite. And if I send my brothers back without Benjamin, dad's going to kill them. <laughs> Joseph's brothers are terrified, and they negotiate to win a concession. And an older brother volunteers to stay behind instead of Benjamin. Ultimately, they do, the sons of Jacob do return. But when they return with Jacob, they walk into a trap. The trap, a soft trap, springs behind them, and that results in their descendants living as an exploited underclass in Egypt until Moses encounters a burning bush and leads his people out some 400 years later. So that's the long story of how hurt people hurt people. Trauma in people begins to look like culture. Jacob's family in Egypt begins to look like an underclass with all the trauma embodied. Their health outcomes are worse. Their life expectancy is less culture gets handed down through the bodies and culture gets handed down through the stories we tell. Trauma keeps getting passed on generation to generation until it's everywhere human beings are. It's everywhere now in the Middle East, in Europe, in the Americas, all over the globe. It played out when white explorers and settlers arrived here on this, what we call the North American continent, craving a place where they could live their life without being exploited, oppressed, and brutalized by systems in Europe. 
they arrived with trauma held in their bodies and then they proceeded to push that trauma onto other bodies, indigenous bodies, black African bodies, even other white bodies without ever having exposed it to the healing light and grace of the God that they professed. Resma Minikin's book, My Grandmother's Hands, lays out a thesis that because white people haven't done their own work of becoming aware of the trauma that they swim in, like water, we continue to inflict traumatic injury on people of color who are less powerful. We can see it in slavery, followed by Jim Crow, becoming embodied in our legal systems, getting decontextualized as we failed to tell the stories of how these things came to be, because we're ashamed of those stories. It became the water we swim in that allows us to say, I'm not racist, while the system keeps inflicting harm. It becomes the water that allows us to remain comfortable while turning up the heat on people of color with our justice system, among other things. This isn't easy to talk about. The current protests centering the Black Lives Matter movement looks right now like an opportunity for things to begin to crack open and change. But Resma Minicum is skeptical. He's skeptical about whether this current movement will result in any lasting systemic change unless we white folks do some serious work on our own embodied but decontextualized trauma. Menachem offers this advice to those who really want to be allies in this struggle. He says, what I feel is the most important thing is that white bodies have to begin to get into a room with each other. Then to deal with the uncomfortableness, deal with the hierarchy that starts to show up, Deal with all the brutality that starts to happen with each other's bodies and then figure out how they're going to develop culture all around beginning to heal over time. His description sounds like Jacob's sons, doesn't it? When they get in a room, they start to have hierarchy and they start to develop violent schemes. Well, Resma Minikin says that if we took on this project, it could take three years, maybe 10 years of working, starting on our individual selves and moving outward. And if we're willing to put in the time, he says, we might begin to develop a culture that leads to healing and wholeness and then to equity and justice in our society. It's important to get that trauma is not the mark of Cain. It's not something that just happens to bad people or soldiers or particular groups of people. This is universal. Another trauma therapist named Peter Levine says that trauma is inescapable. Trauma unites the world. No one gets through life without experiencing it. But just because it's universal doesn't mean that we deal with it well. We can't ignore it and hope it will heal by itself. We know that it won't. It hasn't so far. We all need to do our work individually and together as a group of people in releasing it and healing it. So that brings me around to another way of, of reading scripture. Another way is to look for where God is in the text. This one might get us somewhere to see what God is up to. 
this story of Joseph and his brothers leaves us holding our breath, waiting for God to do God's liberating work. The Israelites are in Egypt for 400 years. Slavery and Jim Crow have existed in our country for 400 years. I've heard a lot of people say, we need a leader. We need a leader to emerge. A leader who will take us where we need to go. I don't think we can wait for that leader to emerge. I think we have to be the leaders we hope will emerge. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I think if we look where spirit is right now, it's in multiple movements. I believe the energy of God's spirit is calling us and empowering us from all directions to take our parts in changing the culture that has led to so much trauma for so many. One place we can start is here, looking anew at our foundational stories, stories like the story of Joseph and Jacob, and seeing how fraught they are with brutality and exploitation. And we can reject that behavior as an inevitability. If we don't shy away from that work, then we can delve deeply into the hidden histories of our state, Oregon, and of our country. This is what we have to do if we're going to build the beloved community. Another trauma therapist, Thomas Hubel, who's a modern mystic, calls this thing we're dealing with right now, the cultural shadows. Deep in the shadows of the past, Grant, <laughs> thank you. We have to begin to look into those shadows. We have to be able to see what's there and feel its impact in our own bodies and then begin to heal it here before we begin to heal it out there. It will not be easy. And it will most certainly be uncomfortable. But we must create a new story of the beloved community. And we have to do it together. May God be with us as we work together. Amen.
And now we come to the time of the prayers of the people. Our community has experienced so many losses in the past few weeks. So as we begin to turn our hearts to prayer, let's remember the families who are grieving and hurting from losses. Megan Walsh and her son Brent, Carol Lynch and her family after John's death, Leslie Sorensen, Joe Link and her children mourning the death of Scott. And let's remember that Donna Clatworthy is sitting with her husband, John, who's in hospice. And that Gwen Pierce is watching and being with her brother, who is also in hospice. And Pat Kerwin is in an assisted living facility that has an outbreak of COVID. We remember also those who go nightly to hold vigil with the protesters and the families who struggle to pay bills and balance work and educate children during this pandemic. We also lift up today that this is the 75th anniversary of the day the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki causing countless people to die and many millions to suffer trauma. Let's pray for those who still live with the effects of that blast and those who have passed it on generationally to their children. There are many more situations that we need to hold in prayer that I haven't named those that you hold in your hearts, people you know about. Let's take a moment in silence to recall those people and hold them in prayer. And let us pray. God, the Spirit moving among us, you are the restless breath of love that sweeps through the world. You move where you will, breaking down barriers, stirring hearts to do your work, and making all things possible, breaking through our cynicism and despair. Thank you for visiting us with newness that reinterprets and re-energizes old stories to point the way toward healing and bringing wholeness to our world. Inspire each one of us to hunger and thirst for justice. Come upon us, Holy Spirit of God. Sweep through our world, bringing transformation. May we let go of fear and greed so that all may share in the rich blessing of your creation. Give us courage in our praying and in our living so that we may act justly, love compassionately, and walk humbly with you all the days of our lives. Come among us this day. Move us toward health and peace. We pray in the real name of Jesus, who taught us when we are together to pray, our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, we have some announcements. Um, one of them is, we need something to celebrate, right? <laughs> this has been kind of a heavy service of worship. And so, I thought it might be fun to celebrate August birthdays, and I think we have among us someone who's celebrating a birthday maybe today. Is it Clyde Ferguson? Um, why don't we all just 
mute ourselves and sing happy birthday and get it out. <laughs> and Clyde, this is for you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Clyde, and everybody in August. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Does everybody on this uh, Zoom get the This Week at First Congregational? If you and you can put it in the chat, let Andre know so he can put you on the mailing list. The This Week at First Congregational email that comes out every Thursday has a ton of things that are going on, things you might want to be involved with. It shows all the things that are going on at the gallery. It says that a book group is forming this Tuesday and it gives you a link on how to join that. Um, there are many, many things. Are there, is there anyone out there who would like to make an announcement since I don't know everything? <laughs> Janet is on uh, vacation with her wife Robin's family. So um, if there's anybody, raise a, raise a hand. And I can't see you all, so let me see. Anybody? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Well, I'm going to assume that you're going to look at this week and jump in where you can. There's lots of stuff happening with the uh, Emerge and with the Immigrant Welcoming Group. And there's tons of ways that we can participate in making our world a better place. So, And as we continue our worship and connect with one another in this virtual space, we remember that our church's ministry has to be sustained financially for the sake of all of those whom we serve. So don't forget, you can submit your pledge or make a one-time contribution online through the church's website, uccportland.org slash donate. You can also call Andre using your credit card or you can mail a check to the church. And if you have any questions about your giving, you can let Andre know. His email is accounts at uccportland.org. Thank you. Let us sing, sing our sending hymn for the healing of the nations. And then we'll those of you who want to, after the benediction and postlude, remain on Zoom and we'll have a virtual coffee hour.
Now, may we be empowered by the Spirit in these coming days to stay faithful to our commitments to God, to each other, and all creatures, great and small, to create a world where all are included with no one left behind, where all are healed and made whole. Amen.